welcome to the Community Homeworks Workshop this evening. We're so glad that you're joining us tonight. My name is Tiana Harrison and I'm the Education and Volunteer Coordinator at Community Homeworks. If you're watching this live, please feel free to comment and let us know where you're tuning in from. Also, if you would like to join in on the discussion or ask questions, please put that in the comment section as well. If you're watching this after the live broadcast, we are still happy to answer your questions it just may take us a little longer to respond. Community Homeworks is a nonprofit organization with a mission to empower homeowners to maintain safe, sustainable, and dignified homes. We get our fundings from grants, gifts, and donations. So if you find value in this workshop tonight, we encourage you to donate on our website at communityhomeworks.org. Tonight's workshop is entitled Electrical Systems, and our instructor is Mr. Harry Jacob. We are very happy that you're here, and we look forward to learning about electrical systems. Well, I'm happy to be here because it's been a long time since we've been in here, not on a screen, and actually have people sitting in front of me, and it just feels good for that because that's the way I made all my living. Um, I, I spent 40 years in the education field. I spent um, most of it in residential construction at both the high school and the college level, and now I'm retired, but I still can't get out of teaching. So anyway, shall we go on with the program? Okay, electrical systems is what we're here. I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, I'm not, a, uh, not an electrician, uh, but I've done an extensive amount of home wiring. So that's what we're talking about. And it's kind of a an interactive lecture because I don't like to just keep talking. My throat gets sore and I forgot what I'm going to say. So people ask questions either here or on the uh, computer or on the, uh, your screens at home. P please come along. So let's go on. Let's move along. Here, whoa, there we go. Okay. This presentation, as it says, and I, I use PowerPoints, but I use them more for my notes because I'm not going to just read everything that's on there. But this one, I'm pretty much going to pick up what's there. This is for information. We're not gonna make anybody in here and anybody that's out there uh, an electrician or able to necessarily do electrical work in their home. In fact, never, never attempt to do anything that you are not 100% sure that you know what you're doing because you can either cause fires, a bad electric shock, or even worse. Electricity will kill you. Okay, I'm gonna start off. Where does electricity come from? We don't manufacture it, we just produce it. We just make it work. It starts in some sort of a power plant. Power plants can be either a dammed river. I think there was one over here out at Mar Marl Creek. That's not in business anymore, is it? No, I don't think so. Um, it can be a coal-fired, gas-fired, atomic plant. It can be wind, can be solar. Um, unfortunately, those two, they're, you know, kind of popular right now, but the fact is they're just not as reliable as some of the other sources. Obviously, look at the day. It's kind of a nasty day, but we could have a lot of wind. So when the, what happens is there's a generator, and a generator is just basically a magnet with a coil of wire around it. And as the magnet spins or is moved, the electrons start to flow and they move out of the power plant into a step-up transformer. This is a small example of a transformer. I'm gonna move over here because I think you... And what is in, what's inside of a transformer are basically two coils, a small coil of wire and a large coil. As electricity moves through one and then moves backward, because we have at our power plants, we have what's called alternating current and the electricity moves back and forth as it moves through one coil, it creates a higher voltage in the second coil. Higher voltage, voltage is, if you got to keep in mind, voltage is the, the measure of electric pressure. You know, everybody thinks about, most people think that electric, that voltage is what really gets to you if you're going to get a shock, but it's actually, that's just the pressure. It moves the electricity at a higher rate. Think of a, a hose, a, a large, full, opened hose. A lot of the water can flow through, but it doesn't have to go very fast. 
but if you constrict it down, the electricity starts moving fast, it's more pressure. And that's what happens at these transformers. And then it goes into the transmission lines. The transmission lines are those large lattice towers. And you see them all over the place here in the county. I've seen them, I don't think there's even some here in the city, but I know there's a lot out in the rural areas. And the electricity can go for great distances. Um, back when I was living on the east side, we used to go to Greenfield Village, the Henry Ford a lot. And there, Thomas Edison has some of the facilities there. At that time, Thomas Edison was trying to go with what's called direct current, where the electricity would flow in one direction and not come back. But you can't step up the voltage with a, a direct current. So it didn't travel very far. And his thought was we could have some sort of electric generating plant in very small areas, like covering two or three blocks. Now think about that. Small generating plant probably covered the about the size of four city lots, but also were coal fired. So if you had that in every four, four or five city blocks, it kind of, or it would kind of be a little smelly. Anyway, as the electricity is flowing through these heavier lines and it gets too close to where its destination is, it goes to another transformer that does just the opposite of what the step up transformer did and starts stepping down the voltage. And it goes from a transmission substation down to a, a, a substation that's closer to homes. And again, you can see those around the city. I think there's a transmission substation around the hospital, Bronson. I think it's, I think that's where it is. From there, it goes to the poles that were more commonly used. Or if it goes underground, if you're having an area where there's underground electricity, and on those poles, there are transformers that drop the voltage down to what we use in the home. And it comes in as actually three wires. One wire is 110, 120, depending on the day. It could be 110 volts, 120 volts. The other wire is the same thing. And the third one is what's called a neutral, which we'll look at a little, a little further on. If it's underground, they're usually those big green boxes that you see, I don't know, if I don't think there's too much underground in the Kalamazoo area, in the actual city of Kalamazoo that I know of, just basically because it's an older city. You might see it you know, in downtown areas. Oops. Yeah, there we go. So when the electricity comes into your house, it can come overhead or underground. Um, this is just a couple of ways that the electricity the wires are attached to the house. It can be one of these masks. That was one of the preferred methods. It just brought the wires a little bit further away from the actual home structure. Sometimes it's just attached to the roof or attached to the uh, soffit or some way or another. It comes down and usually they don't even have a pipe coming down into the meter box. And let me see if I can bring that picture of that meter box up a little bit better. Let's see, it was Zoom. Here we go. Inside the meter box, and I'll even bring up a box that we have here. <clears throat> Can you get that? Is that coming out pretty good on your camera there? I can't see that on the monitor. All right, but inside the box, there are lugs or screws, big heavy screws. One of the wires that comes off the house, the cables, the conductors, goes to one side of the meter. One goes to the other. And then there's another cable that comes in and typically that one isn't even insulated. That goes to the neutral power. This being a 110 side, this being another 110 side, it leaves that and goes into the house. And from there it goes into the, either the breaker or the uh, fuse box, depending on what you have in the house. I tend to think that this is an overhead because I can see two copper, heavy copper wires here, which would be for the grounding purposes. 
And again, we'll discuss a little bit more about grounding. You're looking like, okay, please ask a question if you have one. Okay. Inside the house, we have to distribute the electricity that's coming in from the meter. And we either use a breaker panel, which is the more modern way. And pretty much, I think most people have that now. You find a few homes that have the old fashioned fuse box. In fact, this one here looks very much like the one that I, in the house that I grew up in. And actually you can see there was only four circuits plus one 220 or one like for a range or for a dryer. And this would have been the main breaker that you could pull and have the, all the electricity shut off in the house. So the breaker panel has all these various circuits. They can be to a kitchen, to a dining room, to bedrooms, to washers, to dryers, to whatever. Modern uh, codes now say anything that has a motor has to have its own circuit. That'd be a refrigerator, a dishwasher, a garbage disposal. And of course, that one also has the main shutoff. Let's see one. Grounding is often done. Let me. See. Grounding is often connected to the to a water pipe in the home. Okay, uh, modern codes are saying that's not always the best way to do it. Uh, part of the reason is homes built from about 2010 on have water coming in on plastic pipes, heavier plastic pipes. Um, homes prior to that usually use copper and if you go way back, they even use lead. And you know what's the story about what's happened in Flint. But at least those were conductors. And so you could ground to a water pipe that way. Also, part of the problem that we run into now is that many homes have plastic plumbing. Um, so anyway, let's get back into the um, this. Is that? Why is the box connected to water? Well, it's connected to something that goes to the ground, and water pipes go to the ground. If you follow your, if you have metal pipes in your home, copper or iron, it goes to the meter, meter goes to the outside, and there's a pipe that goes under under the ground. The reason you have grounding is should there be a short in some circuit. Now let's see if I can best describe that. Electricity flows in two directions in the house, alternating current. It comes in on those two heavy cables that go on either side of the electric meter. One being a 110, 120. I usually just refer to it as 110, so I'll continue with that. The other side is 110, 120 where they come together, and there'll be places where they come together, you get the 220, 240, okay? The neutral, that's the wire of the lead, the conductor where the electricity flows back. And that's also part of neutral. Grounding is very is actually connected to the same spot. What happens is if there's a short in an appliance, let's say, um, a mixer, and that what that short, the break in the wire touches the side of the appliance, which is metal. If it's grounded, it trips the breaker or blows the fuse. However, if it isn't, and you touch it, and you ground yourself out, you complete the circuit, and you could die that way. Okay. Um, the thing about electricity, and I can, what happened to me at one point, I was uh, into photography. I had a print dryer, which is just a metal plate that had some heat underneath it. 
and after the prints came out of the wash, the photographic prints, you put it on there. And I, for some reason, I went to touch it to see how warm it was, and at the same time shut the water off. And now I grounded myself out, which could have, fortunately, had I grabbed the faucet and done this, I probably would not be standing here today. But I tapped the faucet to shut it off, and it just gave me a shock. I used to have straight hair. I mean, it was just that way. So, Which is a good, you know, another safety point I wanted to, you reminded me to bring up, Jason. In a basement, you've got a concrete floor. Concrete is ground. It is just the same as being standing out on dirt. Okay. If you're working in your basement, doing anything electrical, even pulling a plug, at least have some flip-flops on. Now, if you've got a carpeted basement or you've got a tiled basement, that's an insulator. It used to drive me crazy. My wife would go down and use the dryer, and we had a house that had a basement laundry. And she'd go down her bare feet, because she always goes down on bare feet. And she'd always hit the dryer. And one time she did get a little shocked, because there was a little small place where the wire that that lets the, the turns the light on and off on the door had a little little bit of a little section of wire that was touching the side and she got a good poke. Fortunately, it wasn't that bad. So then, you know, will you please start wearing flip-flops or something? And eventually I ended up putting a mat next to the dryer because I knew she wasn't going to do that. Okay, so anyway, this is a modern panel block. And, it, it, you know, this illustration is very similar to it, but this shows a little different. In this one, you see two large screws here. Those are where those, uh, those electric feed, those big, heavy, black insulated wires came in. 110 here, 110 here. These up here are referred to buses. All right, come on in, welcome. And a bus is nothing more than a piece of metal with a bunch of holes in it with screws threaded in it. One side, and this illustration shows, where the neutral wire goes. And the other side, or this one's in the bottom, is where the ground wires are connected. Now on this one, it's not as obvious as I'd like it to be, but you'll see that each one of these silver connectors here are just opposite each other. There's a little tab on this side, little tab on this side, and they alternate. Okay, the reason is when you put a breaker and I'm going to find my breaker. It catches on this bar right here. There's a, just a little slot. But on this side, there's a, there, there's a connect, connection, and it touches there, and that's what gives 110 power out to wherever the circuit goes, such as like this one here. And that could be for a bedroom circuit, it could be for a kitchen circuit. However, if you get a breaker that looks like this one, it's two breakers in one. That's a nice heavy one too. When that's installed, it goes across both sides. And as it's shown in the illustration here, you see a black and a red connector, and then a neutral. That would be for a 220, 240, that would be the what would be used for a range, a dryer, an air conditioning con condenser, anything that might take a 220 circuit. So it's connecting from this side and this side. Now, is there any question? Yes, you have a question. Correct. 
Correct. Yes. You put two. Correct. I'm going to go ahead and repeat that question because Jason's over here looking at me saying, he's got to repeat the question. The question was, are most things in the house on the 110, 120 circuit? Yes. Your lighting, the TV, most appliances. Oh, and what happens is you got a breaker like this, one lead comes off. But on a 220, a range, a dryer, an air conditioning condenser. I don't know what else there might be in a house. Oh, possibly an electric hot water tank. That was new to me when I moved out here. And I, on the number of people who have propane out in the country area, and they, we had to replace a dryer. It took us forever to find a gas fired dryer. But anyway, getting back to that, this takes from both sides. Jason's going to come over. That was good because I thought about that. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. I got lazy about taking the screws out, so I'm very lazy. This would be a better illustration here. Let's see. I don't know what brand is that one. I don't think it really. Okay. Uh, that is, is that this? This is a square D. No. That's not my biggest worry. All right. Here's one here. This, this is a, are we getting that in there? Okay. This is a 110 circuit. And you see the what the cables coming in. This would be coming from the meter. And as I said in that illustration that was there, the ground typically isn't insulated. That one it was. This one is bare. Um, and I, I mean, I can say you can touch it all day long. It's not going to do much to you, but don't do it because you never know if somebody did something stupid in the wiring. You know. So. You've got three circuits here. Each one's coming from a 110. We took this one and just moved it to here. This one's coming off of this lead. This one's coming off of this lead. Since this breaker here is not a square D, it won't fit in here. But if I can just illustrate, you can see where it covers two sides of that. And you get the 220. You get 110, 110. But when it gets to the appliance, it applies to where it's needed. It would work, but it would be dangerous. I mean, you could take. I shouldn't even say this because, you know, somebody's going to try it, but. If it's a burnout on a plug, like you're plugging something and you're getting sparks. That would just be because it sounds like if, if it's getting overheated, either the cord is not enough for the appliance or the um, uh, the, the plug, it, it, you know, it, it, it's either overrating. Somebody may have put a heavier breaker. And I didn't repeat that question again. Did they pick it up at all? Okay. <laughs> now I got to remember what it was. They were, they were asking about, we were asking about um, what, what was it? Yeah, now we're going to go back to <laughs> All right, let's 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 go back to that. And now we're going to say, can you get an appliance to work, a two twenty appliance to work by taking two one tens together, and you bring the cables off of that? And the answer is yes, but it's dangerous because they they're supposed to work in tandem, 
and if they're not, one side of that appliance could be faulty, one side may not, okay? And that's why you'll see a typical breaker like this is locked together. Do I know electricians who have done that and put some sort of a metal together on this and tried to make it work? Yes. And if you have an electrician that does that, get rid of them. Now the next question is, is it something like that that causes an overheated outlet? There's a lot of things that can cause an overheated outlet. One is if the cord is not sufficient for the appliance that you're using, or possibly there's some shortages or some loose connections within the plug, or there may be some sort of a short or loose connection in the actual outlet. And if you're in a home that was built in the 70s, you may even have aluminum wire in there. And that's almost as dangerous as the old knob and tubes. Yes. Okay, the question is, can you put higher voltage into an existing outlet? It's pretty difficult. And if it is, if you do it, you're probably going to be causing a fire. I mean, there are some 20 amp plugs. I'm going to find one here because I brought a bunch. Uh, 20, here it is. No, that's not it. Well, I'm looking for a 20 amp. Mm. That's a GFI, but is that? Oh, okay, there it is. Can we, is that showing up at all? I'll tell you what, I'm going to be coming up with an, out, with a, with an illustration that will show that. But it still would be 110 voltage. Um, No, no. You, it would be voltage, it's not the amp, amperage. That that's you know that it could be sometimes a confusing thing. As we were talking about before you got here, voltage is the measure of electric pressure, and it doesn't necessarily mean there's more electrons coming in. They're just coming in at a higher pressure. Amperage is the measure of the amount of electrons or the amount of electricity. So if you were to take, let's just say, one of those double breakers or something like this, take the two wires and put them into an outlet, onto one of the screw outlets, you would have a 220. I don't know of any appliance that you could plug into any sort of an outlet that's 220. And if you found one, get rid of it. Because, I mean, I'm telling you that, you, I mean, seriously, that is something that, that's beyond dangerous. And I can't really see any reason to. Now, the crazy thing is, we, we here in the United States, Canada, and Mexico are one of the few places that actually have 110 appliances. Most of Europe is on 220 and because the voltage is coming in at a higher pressure the appliances work better um, it's, yeah Tiana you got a question uh, one of the participants has a question and they want to know is it possible to get the entire box replaced the entire are we talking about the panel mm -hmm. yes it can be replaced and typically um, if you do any kind of extensive work in, on a, in a home, they will require that you upgrade the panel to a higher amperage. Now, would I do it? Yeah, I would. But I've done a lot. 
Would I tell anybody who hasn't done any kind of electrical work to do it? No, do not. Because no matter how you look at it, this this panel here, we take this away, I can touch this wire, I can do anything I want with it because it's not connected. But these two cables here are always live, even if we are to shut off the main power to the house. These two are always alive unless you go out and pull the electric meter out. Okay. And if I had to replace a box in our house, I would hire it. I mean, I could go out and pull the meter, and I could do it. But at my age, pulling wire like that, I'm getting too old for that kind of stuff. I, I find a lot of things that I'm getting too old for. So, uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing. And I hope I answered all the questions that were needed. Okay. Also, in the box, we talked about grounding. You can see the neutral wires, the white and the ground wires, are on the same bus because literally they are the same thing. So when I wire, though, I try to have ground on one side and neutral on the other. And somewhere, some of the newer boxes actually have a lug here on one side for the ground. And this cable you would see go out and be connected to water pipes for the grounding. Now, in modern, in modern codes, we can't do that anymore because um, a lot of pipes are plastic, a lot of... Water pipes coming in are plastic, so they don't give you the true ground. In fact, now, when we build a house, we have to put two eight-foot-long copper rods into the ground to connect the grounding to. So I hope I can get, an, uh, again, ask questions, because what my wife always says to me is, you always talk to me like I don't know anything. And I said, well, but... But, you know, I, I tend to talk like I do to my middle school students, so I want to make sure that... I, I'm trying to raise it up, but if I don't explain something, you know, I want to go on. We're going to just real quick go over. There's many, many kinds of light bulbs. That was one of the next things that are coming up, light bulbs. And we'll discuss a few of those. This is just kind of a way to get us through. The big thing now, of course, is the LED light bulbs. When I bought my first LED light bulb for the house, I paid about 15 bucks for it. Now you can buy them at the dollar store. Okay. They also have many different styles, many different kinds of uh, shape sizes. The bulb, the screws that put them in are all different sizes and shapes. And you can see they even come in different sizes and shapes in some of their um, same configurations. A little discussion about the types of bulbs. The old incandescent bulb. So what everybody had for a long time. Inside of there is a wire filament. When the electricity goes through it, it starts to glow. This goes back to the old Thomas Edison days. It's resistance. Resistance means your electric meter is going to move a little faster. And it also creates heat. These are becoming just about obsolete. I think they still got a big rack of them at some of the... Uh, big box stores and probably at the hardware stores. But when you configure that an LED bulb, which looks almost the same, uses far less electricity, far less of the amps or wattage. I'm trying to think of what this one is. And you can pick them up for almost the same price. Why go on? Then there's the CFL. And I didn't bring them with me. That's okay. Those curly Q bulbs, they were very popular for a long time. Again, they use a less electricity for the same amount of light, and they do run a little cooler. Uh, in my opinion, though, they're kind of ugly. And the other disadvantage is there's a little bit of mercury in here. And we all know that mercury is now the scariest thing. Well, actually, in construction, mercury was... Not at the worst word mold is, but um, so if they break, there's a little bit of mercury comes out of them. Uh, 
the amount that's in there, and I got to tell you, when I was a kid, we used to have big jars of mercury and play with them. Maybe that explains a lot of things. Um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we just play with it. And there was a case, I think it happened in New York. Um, one of these things broke into a, in a child's room. And the mother freaked out, my God, my child's going to have mercury poisoning. By the time that mercury hit the ground, it was probably nothing more than a little bit of vapor. And it, you know, it was gone. This bit. She spent over $2,000 to have the house made ready for a child, which tells me she's got a lot more money than sense. But she was scared and it was her child. So, you know, what can I say? The ugly, I mean, I was, several years ago, I was in, a, in this beautiful, beautiful mosque with the light fixtures that, you know, you just gorgeous. And they had all these in there. I'm like, this is terrible. Yeah. So what we're doing now to make that kind of Edison or that old antique look is you can get LED bulbs that look like that. They kind of get this old world look. And they glow in kind of a nice orange color. We have those on our outside of our house. Just kind of get that more warm look. The other bulb, and I didn't have an example of it to bring, but is the old halogen bulbs. And they're basically the same as an incandescent. But this little vial here where the filament is, is filled with some inert gas. So they glow, and they glow bright with less electricity, but they get very, very hot to the point where they can burn you. You'll see sometimes in a light fixture, you're putting a new fixture in your house, it will say there's a risk of fire if you put anything bigger than a 60 watt bulb or put anything more than a 100 watt or a 75 watt bulb. But if you look at LED bulbs, they give you 60 watt equivalent, even though they're taking only nine watts, they don't get very hot. And that's the reason for the using the, uh, the, the wattage warning. In fact, I've got a fixture at home said, no, don't use anything more than a 60 watt bulb. And there's three holes in it. I put 100 watts in there. So we have a lot, we have 300 watts of light coming in the room. But it's only using about 45 watts of power. And it's cooler. So keep that in mind. Outlets, next thing. There are several kinds of outlets. Anybody who's got an older home probably has an outlet that looks like this. There's just two slots. And it may not even have the wider slot like this one shows. This is where the white or the neutral wire would be con connected to in the box. This is where the, the hot wire. Nowadays, in fact, modern codes require this. And that second slot is where the ground wire goes the neutral on the ground for safety. You get other wa other outlets are, uh, that can be for a specific 20 amp, like a heavy duty heater, electric heater or whatever. And the plug actually will not have a slot like this. It will have a slot with a T-shape to it. So you can't just plug in any appliance into this one. Same thing with this one. And then getting back to the dryer outlets, and can you have a 220? They look like these. Range and dryer outlets have that kind of configuration. And they're about that big around. They're much larger. The other outlet worth, worth looking at is the GFIC or GFCI. Or I just call them GFC, GFIs, ground fault interrupter circuits. These work in a way that should you have a ground that's not a better way to put it. They actually read an imbalance in the electricity that's going back and forth. Okay. If the electricity going to your appliance, let's say a lamp, goes to the lamp, the same amount of electrons or amperage has to be coming back in the other direction. And if it doesn't, it assumes there's a reason for that. The, the circuit 
assumes there's something wrong. And what's assuming is that you are that person standing on the basement floor, touching a hot wire and it's going to you. And it shuts it off at a very, very fast, like within a fortieth of a second. It's a, it's a saving device. These are these can be used anywhere down. You can also have outlets that are GFI protected downstream, which means that this one here, if this were feet, it is. This GFI that's on the panel wall is feeding this outlet. This outlet is protected by this GFI if it's wired properly. As it shows here, when you get a GFI, you can, they'll have a piece of tape on it that says, this is what's the load side. This is the load. This side is where you connect the line. Line is where it comes from the breaker panel. Um, modern kitchens have to have these. Modern bathrooms have to have these because that's where you're likely to get a nasty little shock especially with all the moisture in it. These should be tested daily, or daily, I'm sorry, monthly. Here I'm, well, you could test them daily, and you don't have to test them by trying to get an electric shock. I made this little thing up here. I don't know, what do we have an outlet? Oh, there's one. Oh, there's two buttons. This one has black and red, the ones that you have in front of you. And you can even see that yellow tape that's on that one too. There's a button that says test. When you test it, you hear it snap. And now there's no electricity going into this one. And then just reset it. My assumption is there might be something in your hair dryer, might be a loose wire or something. Yeah, that's what, because this doesn't do an overload. That's what the breaker's for. This is just if there's an imbalance. So there may be something in the hair dryer that's causing the imbalance. Yeah, so, okay. Big problems here. Okay, and yes, I've caught my lovely wife having a coffee pot and a coffee grinder and a couple, of, you know. <sighs> the outlet, the, the outlet coming in the wall will only give you so much electricity. And if you overload it, it will shut off hopefully, but not always. So obviously you just don't do this because too many appliances can overload it. All right, that was, a, the question is about the, um, the power strips, okay. You can use this. In fact, a lot of times you'll see these like on computers or entertainment centers. They're not drawing that much electricity. And so this will handle it. Notice that the cord's relatively heavy. Okay. If you overload it, you can either see smoke or you'll trip the breaker. But that's not very often that that happens. This would be, I've had these things trip and usually a lot of them have a, a, an actual breaker inside of them if I've got several power tools running at the same time okay there's and these come in various forms there's um little simpler ones like this this might be a little safer because it's only got three outlets um, this is an old-fashioned thing 
this one just has two slots and the you know put a plug in there can't have a grounded plug and you can put as many things on there as you want or at least until it starts sparking That's a good question. That, that, and it has to do with can you, what can you plug into these things? Look at the rating on them. And we're actually, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more, but I, I will say this. If it's rated for 20 amps, then that's fine. But if you go and get a cheap one, then you might take your electric fireplace and it may start smoking. Okay. Can you burn you? You can burn the plug, you can melt the cord, um, or it can trip the breaker. And if you, no, no I'm, <laughs> no, it, it, things like that can happen, okay? And, and that's really, I think, where the next place is here on here, talking about cords, okay? And I, before I'm gonna get into that, I, I want to say that some of these things, like, Something like this is you can plug into an outlet. You saw that on the, all right. Yeah, we had our coffee pot plugged into one and we had the, co the coffee grinder plugged into one. So we still have the outlet and that was good. The chances of the coffee pot and the grinder being used at the same time is pretty slim. And even if it is used at the same time, they don't draw that much. And you can also pick up these things like this one here which you can plug in the wall and now you've got six outlets. Again, you're only limited to how much electricity is coming in. And this one actually has a surge suppressor on it. I don't know if you, are you familiar with surge suppressor, surges? Okay, a surge is when there's a, a lot of electricity coming into an outlet very fast. And I can tell you what happens with that. Just had this happen two weeks ago, three weeks ago. When we had a nice little thunderstorm go through here, I had the loudest boom and the brightest flash I've ever seen. It was about two o'clock in the morning. I wasn't about to get up and find out what's going on. But we live in a wooded area. I looked outside and the next morning, nothing. Walked out. We're going to leave in the morning. Garage door wouldn't come up. Went up down up and down so i disconnected it pushed it up we drove out of the driveway as i'm driving out i'm looking at the neighbor's tree and a big strip is blown off the side of it lightning hit the neighbor's tree it knocked his sprinkler control off the wall knocked his garage door opener out and his range out that's a gas range it knocked his neighbor's dishwasher out and knocked our garage door opener out. So that's a power surge. This would have helped, but obviously I'm not going to plug my garage door opener or something like that, but I'm going to put a surge suppressor in my house. And they're about there. And that, you know, it's good for a, like a computer, because they're pretty sensitive. Anything with a, a circuit board can be pretty sensitive. Uh, yeah, and I, I suspect the neighbor got hit worse because it fouled the tree down into the soil, and he's got a sprinkling system. So it probably went in the house. How it got under my driveway into our garage I mean, it happens. And, you know, what, what is the voltage on a lightning bolt? More than I care to think about. All right, getting back to cords. And this might answer the same question you had about 
what can you put on it? This is a typical lamp cord, okay? It's good for lamps, TVs, radios, whatever. It's not good for an electric heater or a fireplace. And I've seen cases where this actually starts melting, the insulation starts melting, and the wires come together. And if they don't come together, whatever it's sitting on could actually heat up and start burning. So you got to look at a cord and get a heavier cord for whatever you're going to be doing. And not only does you have to look for heavier cords, but also the distance that the cord's going to run. Okay, because if it, the longer it runs, the heavier cord you need to run an appliance. And don't be fooled if you go to a place, particularly if it's like a like a discount place. Um, I, I don't really want to mean mouth somebody, but one of my favorite places to go is over in Schoolcraft at B and G. I love that place. My wife says, "Are you going there again? I hate that place." And then she comes out with more stuff than I do. But just because a cord's thick doesn't mean that the cable inside of it's thick. Okay, because plastic's cheaper than copper. And so you, and you might see a cord that's, oh, look at that. And it's got like a 16 gauge wire, which is the same as what you see here. Cost would be a big thing. And again, going to a, a more reputable place, the good hardware store. And there's two or three of them that I know of here in the, in the Kalamazoo area that I really like. Um, and the big box stores, they can be reputable too. And this just some of the things to think about. Um, obviously, this is just a kind of a jumble up of cables to illustrate what things look like. When you got an electric cord, always make sure you check it out and make sure it's in good condition. Uh, and this one here, actually, I've got a couple like that. This is what you maybe have talking about earlier and overloaded. OK. Um, also, make sure that when you plug something in, it goes all the way in because uh, obviously that's an electric place. Somebody, you know, even a small child could get in there. Um, actually, typically uh, the ground on a circuit is below the two slots. But when my son re did his kitchen, we were just talking about that. I said, you put it upside down. He says, no, I've got the ground on this side because should behind the stove, it gets pulled out a little bit and something falls behind there, it's gonna hit the ground before it hits the actual. I said, okay, it makes sense. What am I supposed to know? And the other thing I, I want to bring out, when you do your Christmas decorating and you leave your cords outside in the wet and the snow, you got these little devices here. I picked one up, got a bunch of them. And you just put your cord inside of this. They split open, seal it up, and it keeps them dry. I'm sorry? Well, it will do that, but it also keeps them dry, or it helps keep them dry. And that's where one of the places the GFIs can actually break trip. And I know when I do my Christmas decorating, um, I oftentimes use a plug that has uh, multiple plugs on the end, or a cord that has multiple plugs on the end. They don't fit in this. So what I do is I'll take a small milk carton and cut the bottom off, lay the cord inside of that, and I'll take a larger one, cut the bottom off that, and put it on top of that, and it keeps it dry. It's just a little safer. Switches. How much time we got, Jason? I think we're running pretty late, aren't we? Okay. Right. Yes and no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, the, we're asking about when the last illustration had uh, electric tape around a cord, and is that safe? And my answer is yes and no. 
if it's just the outer casing, um, you know, inside of this cord here, there's the outer insulation. Inside of it is three wires. If they're, if they're, yeah, if the wires are covered and they're not exposed, other than maybe the ground wire might be, because the ground wire oftentimes is not insulated, then yes, you can wrap some oak, and I've done that too. Okay. It is. It is. Because those things get expensive when you got to keep buying them, you know. Um, switches in the house, there's all kinds of them. There's dimmer switches, there's the paddle switches, there's the typical toggle switch, and round dimmers and dimmers that can slide up and down and uh, have an on off, and then another just plain dimmer switch. Um, what else was it? Oh, that got cut off. Maybe I, I, shoot. Okay, well, that's good. Let's go back, Liz. Inside every switch, they're all about the same. If you have an older home, you might have some of these push button switches like this. You have one? Okay. Or these old twist ones like this. But a basic house switch is either what's called single pull, single throw. That's when you turn it on or you turn it off. Or it's a three way or a double pull, single throw. It's three way. And you'll notice there's three screws on this one. That's the ones that you find at like the end of a hallway, at each end of a hallway or at the top and the bottom of a stairway. So you can switch it on and then get down to the bottom and turn it off. And that takes three wires rather than just a double wire to do that but any switch i don't care if it's this type it's this type they're all the same as this knife switch and there's a question a sensor okay the the question is about a sensor light where you walk into room and it goes on i'll get into that in just a second because that's that's a good question they all are basically this just a couple pieces of metal that make contact or don't make contact. Something very similar that's in any switch. Now the question about, uh, we had one here, didn't we, Jason? We did, I don't Okay, well, okay. So the question is about the ones when you can walk into a room and it goes on. Basically, there's an electronic switch in there, okay? And that just turns on the power on and off, but there's a, a sensor that can sense motion. And that's all it is. And a lot of them also have a button where you can turn it on manually. And that, that's all they are. Just It's got something that senses you're in the room. That's, it flips the switch. There might be a solenoid inside that. A solenoid, just an electronic device that turns on and off. This room uh, is actually on a sensor so that if we hold still, um, it will stop like it all the lights go oh there we went i went too far but i'm going to make it real quick because it is getting a little later i'm just going to skip that one because we talked about that anyway smoke detectors that's part of the electric system um modern homes require a smoke detector one on each floor, one in a hallway near bedrooms, and one in each bedroom. When I built my first house, well, the house that my wife and I moved from was built in 85. That just required smoke detectors, one on each floor. And they had to be connected together. So if one went off, they all went off. Okay. But a smoke detector, I don't care. <laughs> I'm, is the fire department still giving those out here or not? I don't know. I know Ostromo's not, but I don't think it used to be. But they're very inexpensive. They do save lives. I mean, I can't stress that enough. Even if it's just a simple one that hangs up on the ceiling with a battery in it. But 
modern times, if you can get them interconnected. So if there's a fire in the basement, it goes off on the second floor. It's a learning. And there are even battery operated ones that use like a, um, I don't know if it's Bluetooth or it's Wi-Fi or just some sort of radio signal that connects it to the other. So they all go off and they don't, you don't have to have the hard wiring. Simple placement, follow the instructions that come with them, but basically just keep it out of any place with the ceiling and the wall come together or out of any corner because there will be a dead space there. Um, and you got a question, I'm sorry. Yes, that's called hard wiring. Though it's, um, you can get it here. <laughs> Most of them have a test button on them. Um, I brought one here. <clears throat> There's a button there. And you can just reach up, push it, and it goes off. It's also very handy because it's also what they call a hush button. Because it can silence it if, there's, if you're cooking or whatever. Question. If it's okay, the question is that you thought it was working. If it's periodically beeping, beeping, no, that is actually telling you the battery's going bad. That's a warning to tell you the batteries needs to be replaced. Okay, now this this one here is what's called a uh, photoelectric. It sees smoke. Most of the smoke detectors that are, that are out are ionizing, and they pick up fumes and so on. The house we live in now, somebody thought it was a brilliant idea to have a smoke detector on the ceiling diagonally about 10, 12 feet from the, where the stove is. And obviously my wife is a good cook. I mean, you can see that. But they, she, you know, it does. I finally just disconnected that one totally. But we still had trouble with the one in the hallway. So I went and got these that read smoke. Now she can cook bacon all she wants, and it doesn't. And if it does get that smoky, then we're going to get out. But I can tell you that I was just last night, I was I, I do photography for the Oshmo Fire Department. And I was on a, an apartment off of Drake. And the woman who lived there, went down, got her laundry out of the laundry, I guess there's a laundry room in the, in the apartment, brought up the basket, set it inside her door next to the bag of the laundry she's going to take down. And she left for whatever reason. I, we don't know. Something inside of that basket that she brought up. I'm suspecting it was just some uh, lint from the dryer that was smoldering. It started smoking, started smoking. And we got the call from one of the neighbors to go out there and see what's going on. The man that was living in the house was in a bedroom sleeping. He never woke up until the firefighter actually pounded on his door and broke it down and got that smoldering out. The, apparent, there was an alarm in this apartment but I got a feeling that the maintenance isn't that well. And it was probably just dead battery, took the battery out. Maybe it was one of those cases where the smoke detector was close enough to the kitchen where there was a lot of cooking going on and they got tired of listening to it. But fortunately, some neighbors saw that and the fire, because I still had to bring him out and he was in the ambulance for smoke inhalation. Had it, you know, he could have easily died in there. Jason. Uh, we have a question online. Uh, Lynn wants to know, uh, she said, I, have an elect I had an electrician tell me the battery-operated smoke detectors are no longer legal. He wanted to put in a hardwired system. I said, no, what's really required now? I don't know that um, they're illegal to have a battery-powered one. 
I do know that in new construction, they're not legal. You have to have hardwired. Um, but if you have an older home, it sure would be di very difficult to start running a lot of wires through the walls. Um, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know what the codes are. Uh, my daughter bought an, a house several years ago, and this was over in the west city of Westland, and it didn't have smoke detectors. They required us to put smoke detectors outside the bedrooms, in the bedroom. They, we had to go through the new codes. And we had to go with those um, radio signal ones. Yeah, so I would assume maybe the new code is, if they're doing some extensive work in that house, they may have to go to a hard wire or at least an interconnected system. But again, uh, even those interconnected ones are like $35, $40 a piece where you can pick up, you know, sometimes you'll see, especially at the beginning of the year, they'll, be, they'll see a sale, three or four of them for 20 bucks. So this is a battery operated one. Is it the best? No. The ones that are interconnected are far better. But it's better than nothing. So, Lynn, um, if you're tuning in, I will check. We'll do some follow-up and figure out what the, the current code is for um, updating those uh, smoke detectors, and I will let you know. Yeah, my last house I built, I think, was in 2008, so I, I haven't kept up with the codes the way I should have. Thank you. And just, I, you know, as again, I just hope that you found something. You learned at least one something in this thing, okay? Uh, if nothing else, that Harry just talks too much. Um, but again, just know that electricity is a great thing to have in your house. It's convenient, but it can, it can be very dangerous if it's improperly done. Um, and in most cases, I say get an electrician. Or if we ever have one of our hands-on classes where I show you how to fix a switch or a plug, I'm still going to tell you to get an electrician, but at least you'll know how to do it because I know you probably won't. That's it. Thank you. Thank and, you very much, and I can tell you, it's just great to see people in front of me now instead of Jason on the computer screen. I thought I looked good on the computer screen. Yeah, but Jason, neither of us look good on it. Nobody looks good on a computer screen anymore. I wanted to thank everyone for uh, those of you who came out to visit us in person tonight. Um, and also for those who joined us online. So we really appreciate you tuning in for this workshop. Um, if you have other workshops you would like us to offer, please let us know. You can either email us at education at communityhomeworks.org or you can give our office a call, or you can um, stop in and visit us, whatever. Uh, we want to do classes uh, that people are interested in. So um, please let us know those things. And again, thank you very much, Harry, for the information tonight. If, My pleasure, and I hope I... people who are here in, in the room still have more questions, we can probably take a few, more, a few more questions. If you have more questions online, feel free to put them into the comment section, and we will see you next Tuesday. And I'll hang out for as long as necessary. Do I need this on anymore? Okay. No, I'll hang around, whatever. I know.